uh, has said, as well as in Afghanistan, our Middle East peace efforts. So, uh, uh, yes, rejoice the moment, uh, appreciate what we've done, build on that, but understand that we have a long way to go, and we are a long way away uh, from obtaining the real victory that we will obtain in Iraq and Afghanistan, and that is allowing those people to govern themselves and secure themselves. So the mission is, in, is dangerous and complicated still and will remain dangerous and complicated uh, well into the next uh, couple of years. The Senator, a, an Iraqi government member who just visited Saddam Hussein in captivity said he was defiant. He took absolutely no responsibility for uh, everything that he has done. Uh, there's still the open question of weapons of mass destruction. Realistically, do you expect Saddam Hussein to give up any information about whether or not he had WMDs and where he put them? Well, I think it would, uh, would be very predictable to assume that he would be defiant until the end. But uh, this is just the beginning of Mr. Saddam Hussein's capture, his interrogation. The process will uh, go on. There will be a tribunal. Uh, so I think it's uh, too early to tell how much intelligence we can get from him. But knowing who he is, knowing of his past, uh, his brutality, what he did to that country, uh, it would be a very consistent uh, understanding and assuming that he would be defiant, at least initially. I'm not so sure that will be the end game for him, but uh, we'll be patient, we'll do what we need to do, and again, we must do it right, because in the end, the Iraqis and the Muslim and Arab world must have confidence in the process we use, uh, not just to try him, but uh, as we move forward to put in place an Iraqi government that can defend itself. Senator Hagel, thank you very much. Thank you. They are dancing in the streets of Baghdad and in other places around the world today as the news breaks that Saddam Hussein has been captured, dragged out of a hole in the ground in a farmhouse near Tikrit. He had a pistol with him, but U.S. forces did not have to fire a shot. Bedraggled, haggard Saddam Hussein is in custody. U.S. Administrator Paul Bremer broke the news at a news conference earlier this morning. This is a great day in Iraq's history. For decades, hundreds of thousands of you suffered at the hands of this cruel man. For decades, Saddam Hussein divided you citizens against each other. For decades, he threatened and attacked your neighbors. Those days are over forever. Saddam Hussein is in custody. On the uh, left of your screen there, you see him as he looked when he was dragged out of that bunker in a farmhouse south of Tikrit. Almost immediately, coalition forces gave him a shave. And the picture on the right there is what Saddam Hussein looked like a few hours after he was uh, taken into custody. He is said to be cooperative. He is said to be talking. But he is also said to be defiant. Uh, well, someone who would know something about that, Azam Alwash, a, uh, an Iraqi exile who is in Baghdad, joining us now. Uh, Azam, when you got the news that Saddam Hussein was arrested and alive, were you surprised that, that he didn't go out in some blaze of glory gunfight? Oh, I knew that, uh, deep in my heart, I knew he was a coward that would, that loves, loves life uh, more than anything else. I knew he was going to get caught alive. I'm, uh, when I heard the news, you were just recounting Bremer's uh, uh, press conference, and I remember I was in the car when, when I was listening to that, to that news conference, and I, I was teaching my, my driver how to do high fives. It was, it was an incredible, an incredible uh, uh, piece uh, uh, an incredible moment that I will never forget the, the rest of my life. It's just, this, is, this is just incredible. I'm so glad that they caught him alive. Mm -hmm. We will show them that it just, it's just incredible. I'm sorry, I'm, I'm, I'm overjoyed with excitement. You, well, you can hear it in my voice. Yeah, sure. We can hear it in your voice, and I think we it's, share in that excitement, but it's difficult for us in the United States to understand what this guy's continuing presence, uh, sort of looming over Iraqi society, invisible as he was, what that presence has done to the average Iraqi. Now that they see him locked up, what is that going to do to the mood of, of Iraqi citizens? I, I think it's going to do wonders to the psyche of Iraqi, I, I, the Iraqis. They, they, uh, the last 35 years of the Republic of Fear has uh, built into them this, 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 uh, this uh, secret code of conduct that you don't express anything uh, hostile towards the regime for fear that it might come uh, back and haunt you, as, as it happened in 91. I think this, uh, this is essentially an end of a very bad chapter in the history of Iraq. I think Iraqis will begin the healing process. Moreover, 
I am looking forward to the to the uh, court and, and, and to, to his trial, where the healing process will start, where the where the where the stories of suffering will tell the world that its silence for the last five years has helped create a, a, a society of 25 million people. I'm sorry, I. Uh, you can hear the celebration, I'm sure. Th those are celebratory uh, uh, gunshots, are they not? <laughs> yeah, it's not, it's not aimed at me. These people are just celebrating the, 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 the uh, end of this chapter. This, this is just, just... Thank you to all uh, the servicemen and women uh, of the United States and the coalition for making this possible. You cannot understand the appreciation of the Iraqi people. Ninety-five uh, percent of them are extremely grateful at the end of this of this of this regime. Uh, you're only hearing the the disgruntled uh, uh, the, the two disgruntled people who have lost their privilege. Uh, thank you, thank you, thank you to everybody there. Just so I can explain to our viewers who, who might not be uh, familiar with the Iraqi custom, but it, it is quite common uh, in times of great happiness, and there haven't been enough of them lately, but in times of great happiness, it's quite common for them to go out into the street and, and fire off guns, and, and that's apparently what they're doing. Um, talk about the, the impact. One of our guests earlier was saying, you know, the fact that Saddam was taken into custody looking so meek, so beaten down, so bedraggled. You know, here is this guy who set him up, set himself up to be another Hammurabi, another, you know, another Nebuchadnezzar, uh, a, a real powerful leader, and the fact that he, he gets dragged out of literally a hole in the ground, what is that going to do uh, to the Iraqi citizens whom he has so tormented? Uh, it will only reaffirm, look, uh, they say a picture is worth, worth a thousand words. That, that picture, in fact, essentially reaffirms the belief of everybody that this, this person is just, just uh, like the rat that he, he is. He lived in a hole. Uh, uh, you know, it, it, every, all Iraqis understand the psyche of this, of this, of this, of this terrorist. Um, it, it'll just reaffirm to, to them what they have not known. What I want to impress uh, is that this picture is gonna is gonna do a lot more in the Arab world where they see him as a hero uh, rather than the terrorist that he is. Um, this is going to do a lot more to the Arab psyche uh, than the Iraqi psyche. We know what what he is all about. We we know we need no lessons. We don't need to see him in in in, in uh, uh, Rasputin kind of uh, state of uh, being to 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 know that that uh, this this. That, that, that he is he's a terrible man, an evil man, evil reincarnated. Well, you, you might soon see him in the dock. We, we know what he is. You might soon see him in the dock of a criminal trial. Dr. Azam Alwash from Baghdad, thank you very much for joining us. Thank you. Linda. About five minutes from now, actually less than that, you will see the president in the cabinet room of the White House. He will give his official reaction to exactly what happened. We know a little bit about how he found out. He got the first call, 3.15 p.m. Eastern Time yesterday, from Secretary of Defense Donald Rumsfeld, who was careful about raising the president's expectations about who they had, but pretty confident. Uh, the defense secretary then went on to host a holiday party and uh, played his cards pretty close to the vest. But the president moved from Camp David to the White House, uh, canceled his trip to church, and he finally got the uh, confirmed word at 5.14 a.m. Eastern Time from National Security Advisor Condoleezza Rice. And now other important figures in Washington are getting the word as well. One of those who's gotten the word, of course, is Senator Lindsey Graham, who's with us here in the studio. When Welcome, Senator. I nice got it from you. Fox News this morning. You did? Yes, I did. Well, we're happy That's to why be I your, watch uh, Fox. Your, uh, your news of choice. <laughs> your reaction? Uh, it's all been said. Happy for the troops. Perseverance matters. I was over in August and I kind of made a prediction that I thought we'd get him by the end of the year. And it really no way to know that other than I could see in the soldiers' eyes, the general's eyes, that they wanted to get this guy. The president, every time I've been around him, you could see he's in it for the long haul. So big news. But here's the story that needs to be reported more on. France, Germany, and Saudi Arabia lent billions of dollars to Saddam Hussein. We lent some money to Saddam Hussein. There's over $120 billion of outstanding debt that was incurred by Saddam Hussein. The largest debt holder to the Saddam era is Saudi Arabia. I think it's imperative for the 
international community to forgive every dime of debt. I think it would be a travesty to make the Iraqi people pay back debt incurred by their oppressor and their dictator. So I'm hoping that when Secretary Baker goes overseas, that when we try this guy, that the world community will take the right path. The, the country that insists on repayment from lending money to Saddam Hussein, if they insist on the Iraqi people to pay that debt back, they've lost their moral way. I think that's the big winner today, is uh, the forces of morality. Your interesting uh, thought, because the uh, uh, Saudi Prince Bandar made a statement today congratulating the United States on capturing Saddam Hussein, so we'll see if they follow we it up with deeds. We don't need congratulations, we need partners, and we need to get some debt off the back of the Iraqi people, and we need some people to help us win this war on terror. It's not just about us, it's about everybody that loves freedom. So now's a chance to come and contribute instead, instead of just complaining. What about Russia? Russia uh, is this a huge week, debt holder. And, and this week said that they do not foresee well, forgiving Well, let me any tell debt. you, we need to be tough. Any country that wants the Iraqi people to pay back debt that incur that was given to Saddam Hussein to keep them uh, terrorized has lost their moral way. This is a moral decision for countries. We should forgive every penny of money anybody lent to Saddam Hussein to keep him in power. It is part of the war on terror. The reason the, the attacks won't stop, there are other forces in Iraq other than old regime people who hate us and who hate freedom. So the fight's going to go on. This is the front line on the war on terror and we need more allies and we need to take the road less traveled, less criticism, more help. Quick question about uh, United States politics, separate from that. Of course, one of the things that Democratic candidates for president have been hammering the president has right. been the conduct of the post-war. Does that change? Well, not all of them, but Howard Dean uh, has gotten smaller as a candidate. He's the big loser in all this because if he were in power, if he were our president, Saddam would still be in power, and he was part of the war on terrorism. Over time, you will find how deeply connected he was to the terrorist organizations. Senator Lindsey Graham of South Carolina, we thank you very much. God bless. We expect to be about five minutes away from President Bush addressing the nation. Let's go to our Washington managing editor in, uh, in Washington, Britt Hume. Thanks, Linda and John. In just a few minutes, President Bush, as you've noted, will address the nation on the capture of Saddam Hussein. He will speak from the cabinet room in the White House, and after making his statement, it was expected that he would take questions from pool reporters, but apparently that is now not to be. The president will make his statement and then leave the room. Uh, our senior White House correspondent, Jim Angle, has been at the White House all this long, and for the White House people, anyway, very happy morning. Uh, Jim, what do you expect to hear from the president? Brett, uh, we got some idea of what the president is likely to say this morning from officials who said he sees this as good news for the Iraqi people, a uh, fairly obvious point there, that Saddam Hussein was a brutal dictator who repressed his people for decades, and that now the Iraqi people can finally be assured that Saddam will not be coming back. And that sentiment was seconded by the president's closest ally on Iraq, British Prime Minister Tony Blair. Saddam has gone from power. He won't be coming back. That the Iraqi people now know, and it is they who will decide his fate. Now, the president has called nine world leaders to give them the good news, including Adnan Pachachi, who is the rotating president of the Iraqi Governing Council, as well as several members of Congress of both parties to inform them as well. And, Britt, it must be said at this point, it is nothing short of a miracle that they were actually able to find Saddam in that little hole he was in, because military officials said today they had been to this area before, they had been down that road before. It is quite possible officials or military forces had simply walked over Saddam this time they found him. You're, we're talking, Jim, about literally walking over him, aren't we? Literally walking over him because he was down in this spider hole that is essentially the size of a grave with a ventilation uh, vent so that, so that he could breathe. It was concealed from the top. Forces were able to find that. They went to the two farmhouses, which are a few hundred yards apart. Where he was hiding was right in between them, Britt, and the, the hole that you go down into was concealed by bricks and some styrofoam that had a carpet over it and so forth, something light so that he could move it himself. Uh, it, it really is amazing that forces were able to uncover this and to find him in there, and he gave up without a struggle. Well, I guess from what the general, you heard General Odierno talking about this earlier, I guess from uh, from what he says, it, it must not have been a very uh, adequate space for Saddam Hussein to move around at all or even prepare to resist or anything. Once they, I guess there's the hole, I guess we can see the video they showed of it earlier. That pipe is said, by the way, as you know, Jim, to be an air pipe. So you picture Saddam lying down in there, and uh, and the uh, and the uh, U.S. military forces coming upon him. I, I guess there wasn't much he could do. Although I suspect that 
some of his loyalists will wonder why he didn't take a gun, and we're given to believe there were guns there, and kill himself. Yeah, why he gave up so easily. He is said to have had a pistol on him, Britt. Uh, it really is amazing the way this all ended and the way the forces stumbled across him. Uh, the other thing that's interesting about this is that the way they found him was not from a walk-in or a tipster. It is from people they have been interrogating. And over the last few days, they had rounded up a number of people who were close to him, people who might have been instrumental in help hide him, former bodyguards, uh, family associates, that sort of thing bringing them in as well as their family members and associates and interrogating everyone over the last several days. Two days ago, they finally got a break from someone they were interrogating. A lot of these people wouldn't know anything, an official says, but occasionally someone will say, I don't know anything, but my cousin knows somebody who, you know, and they would slowly tighten the circle. 24 hours before the raid, they got some intelligence that they thought was useful. That is what they acted on. That is what led them to the area. And then it was just happenstance and luck that brought them, as they cordoned off the entire area, that brought them to the place where Saddam had hidden himself. Now, Jim, the president, I guess, has known about this since sometime yesterday afternoon. What do we know about when he was informed, how, by whom, and all that? He was called to Camp David by Defense Secretary Rumsfeld, who said, now, Mr. President, I have something to tell you, but you know, initial reports can always be inaccurate. He said, sounds like good news. And uh, Secretary Rumsfeld said, military forces have a man in custody. They believe it's Saddam Hussein. And the president said, that is good news. And uh, from there on, we know the rest. There was not real confirmation. The president wanted to know, how do they know? Uh, Rumsfeld called and found out that it was from identifying characteristics on his body at that point. They then did other means to uh, make sure they knew who they had. And at 5 a.m. this morning, 5.15 to be exact, the president was called by his national security advisor and told they are now certain it's Saddam Hussein. Britt. Jim, thanks very much. Uh, we're just waiting here for the president to walk into the Roosevelt Room and deliver this statement. There you see a shot of the room. I mean, I'm sorry, the cabinet room. There you see a shot of that room as we await uh, uh, President Bush's arrival. And here he comes. Good afternoon. Yesterday, December the 13th, at around 8.30 p.m. Baghdad time, United States military forces captured Saddam Hussein alive. He was found near a farmhouse outside the city of Tikrit in a swift raid conducted without casualties. And now the former dictator of Iraq will face the justice he denied to millions. The capture of this man was crucial to the rise of a free Iraq it marks the end of the road for him and for all who bullied and killed in his name. For the Ba'athist holdouts largely responsible for the current violence, there will be no return to the corrupt power and privilege they once held. For the vast majority of Iraqi citizens who wish to live as free men and women, this event brings further assurance that the torture chambers and the secret police are gone forever. And this afternoon, I have a message for the Iraqi people. You will not have to fear the rule of Saddam Hussein ever again. All Iraqis who take the side of freedom have taken the winning side. The goals of our coalition are the same as your goals. Sovereignty for your country, dignity for your great culture, and for every Iraqi citizen, the opportunity for a better life. In the history of Iraq, a dark and painful era is over. A hopeful day has arrived. All Iraqis can now come together and reject violence and build a new Iraq. The success of yesterday's mission is a tribute to our men and women now serving in Iraq. The operation was based on the superb work of intelligence analysts who found the dictator's footprints in a vast country. The operation was carried out with skill and precision by a brave fighting force. Our servicemen and women and our coalition allies have faced many dangers in the hunt for members of the fallen regime and in their effort to bring hope and freedom to the Iraqi people. Their work continues and so do the risks. Today, 
on behalf of the nation, I thank the members of our armed forces, and I congratulate them. I also have a message for all Americans. The capture of Saddam Hussein does not mean the end of violence in Iraq. We still face terrorists who would rather go on killing the innocent than accept the rise of liberty in the heart of the Middle East. Such men are a direct threat to the American people, and they will be defeated. We've come to this moment through patience and resolve and focused action, and that is our strategy moving forward. The war on terror is a different kind of war, waged capture by capture, cell by cell, and victory by victory. Our security is assured by our perseverance and by our sure belief in the success of liberty. And the United States of America will not relent until this war is won. May God bless the people of Iraq. And may God bless America. Thank you. Very brief statement by the president, no questions. Uh, striking uh, that he mentioned Saddam Hussein will now receive the justice, as the president put it, he denied to others. And the president then saying to the people of Iraq, you will not have to face the rule of, of Saddam Hussein ever again. That, of course, is a message that uh, the president has repeatedly communicated uh, in, uh, in statements over time. And I think it was believed by him that the Iraqi people, after the, after the fall of Baghdad and the entire collapse, military collapse of Iraq uh, uh, occurred, that that would be something that the Iraqi people w could take to heart. Uh, what the president and many, many others may not have realized at the time was two things. One was that the, the fact that Saddam Hussein was not captured or killed would leave a kind of pall over, over Iraqis and a, and a striking and extraordinary amount of fear. And it has also, of course, left hope in the, in the hearts, if they can be called that, of those who plan and carry out these attacks that have continued on coalition forces and more recently, sort of, it seems, randomly on innocent Iraqis. So uh, a triumphant moment for the president. You saw him being very careful not to seem triumphant uh, and, of course, warning at the end that uh, much violence and difficulty might lie ahead. This all happened, of course, uh, near the town of Tikrit, Saddam Hussein's hometown, and Fox News correspondent Greg Palcott is standing by live there at an army base uh, where the military operation that caught Saddam Hussein was launched. Greg? Hey, Britt, appropriately enough, we're reporting to you from a palace high atop a bluff overlooking the Tigris River here in Tikrit. This is the 4th Infantry Division headquarters, and those are the folks that found the number one most wanted man in the world right now just about 24 hours ago. In fact, the 4th Infantry Division soldiers that I talked to expressed their happiness, their satisfaction that they finally got their man. We have been with them in Humvees and trucks and RPG and, and uh, armored vehicles for the past five five or six months of going all across this area. I can tell you the hunt has been very, very long, very, very hard. The temperature is very high, in fact, 140 degrees Fahrenheit at some point. So to finally get their man, a great sense of satisfaction. Also, uh, Britt, a little sense of how difficult it is to find this person. We were just about a week ago driving down the same side of the Tigris River, maybe about five or six miles from where Saddam Hussein was caught. We were driving by a few adobe huts, and I turned to my crew and said, you know, Saddam Hussein could be in one of those huts. And in fact, he was just a couple of miles down the river. Now, we were laid out for us today from General Ray Odierno the exact intelligence process that led up to the finding of Saddam Hussein. I know I've been with uh, soldiers here, sitting down with police officers, sitting down with civilians as they listen to their stories. And apparently that got very, very intense over the last couple of weeks or so. In the last week or so, five to ten members of key families brought in, and as we heard in the last 24 hours, in fact, a key bit of information leading the soldiers, leading the troops here, and special operations agents to the place where they found Saddam Hussein. I asked General Derno, in fact, whether he was surprised that there was no resistance, there was no fight coming from Saddam Hussein. He said, well, this is just one of maybe 20 or 30 places that he had been in probably in the past a month. He had one pistol, but he was probably not in a position to 
to put up a very good fight, as we've been reporting also to other individuals who are with them with AK-47s. One more thing, Britt, it is not just uh, one or two people who found this uh, this man. It was, it was 600 people, 600 soldiers, troops of the artillery, cavalry, scouts, you name it. Many, many units coordinated uh, in this action. It all moved out very fast. I talked to one guard at the gate who was involved, in fact, in the operation. He said he didn't know what was happening until an hour before the troops rolled out. They rolled out. They got their man. A lot of satisfaction here tonight. And one more note here, uh, Britt, in the town of Tikrit, a little bit of subdued atmosphere. I was in Baghdad when the news first broke. We heard AK-47 fire, celebratory gunfire. People very, very happy. Here, we're in a town that's felt to lean a little bit towards Saddam Hussein and some factions, a little bit more of a, a quieter mood in this area. Britt. Greg, it is sort of striking, isn't it, that we had this enormous amount of firepower and manpower, if you will, swooping down on this uh, small house uh, where Saddam Hussein's only bodyguards were a couple guys. And it would seem, wouldn't it, that, uh, that perhaps that was one of the ways he was able to, to move around and to hide so effectively was that there was no, uh, no security detail of any size, no entourage, and uh, nothing that would have caused, uh, called attention to him. That's exactly right. That's the intel that we have been getting for the past month or six weeks, that he, in fact, was traveling with a very, very small group of people. In fact, we saw his sons, Uday and Kuze, caught up in Mosul with a small group of people as well. But, in fact, that's right. He was moving around. I remember being out in, in a Humvee of the 4th Infantry Division about three months ago, and we got a crackle on, on the radio, and they said, look for a white Mercedes-Benz. And I, I turned to the sergeant that I was traveling with, and I said, uh, who might be in that white Mercedes-Benz? And he said, number one, we think, maybe. In fact, he was traveling in a very, very lean operation. You can see behind me some of the pictures that I believe you've been seeing as well, some of the photographs taken of the area. You can see the, the squalid nature of his last uh, place of, of rest before captivity. Uh, it was basically just a hole in the ground in between two farmhouses. In fact, this area, just along the Tigris River, Brit, and in fact, perhaps from that area, Saddam Hussein could see the palaces the 60 buildings in this palace complex, I might add, that he once built and once inhabited, Britt. Greg Palcott, thank you, thank you very much. Joining me here with, uh, with observations on these events, Chris Wallace, the host of Fox News Sunday, Juan Williams, senior correspondent of National Public Radio, and Bill Salmon, senior White House correspondent of the Washington Times. And from the White House as well, our senior White House correspondent, Jim Angle, available as well. Chris, what are your thoughts about the, these extraordinary events that uh, so we sort of found out, started finding out about about 5 a.m. this morning? Well, there, there are all kinds of aspects of it that I think that strike you and have played out over the course of these hours. First of all, just the extraordinary details of capturing Saddam Hussein. As we say, he was hidden in a rat hole under an adobe hut in the middle of a, a farm compound. And I suppose, uh, you know, I, like a lot of people who have nothing to do with it, had wondered how could he possibly stay hidden when you see how well he was hidden, you wonder how was it they, they were ever able to catch him, and obviously it was they had to have somebody who could tell them where to look. And then those pictures, you know, to use Saddam Hussein's phraseology, the mother of all mug shots. <laughs> you know, to see this picture of Saddam Hussein, the feared, brutal dictator who used to operate from the splendor of his palaces in Baghdad and around the country, having taken millions of dollars from the treasury of, of Iraq and spent them on his own personal comfort. And here he looks like some bedraggled street person. And you have to wonder, in some sense, uh, if he wasn't almost relieved to be caught, because... Uh, when you, when you see the, that little rat hole that he was hiding in, to, to continue for months to hide under these conditions must have been must have been pretty tough duty. Yeah, exhausting. And, and, and the only other thing I guess that I, I am struck by is that here is this man who has been calling on all of his followers to fight jihad, to fight to the death, to oppose the great Satan, to oppose America, and when his personal opportunity came, the pistol that was on his hip stayed in its holster. And I think that that says something very powerful and is going to be much harder for some of Saddam Hussein's followers, people in the Arab world. Why should I go to my death if Saddam Hussein was willing to just uh, put up his hands and be captured? Looks sort of like the Nick Nolte mugshot that uh, we saw on a smoking gun some months ago. I thought it was, it was striking that Bush um, was careful not to gloat 
I mean, he learned his lesson, although he didn't gloat on the USS Abraham Lincoln, I think he learned that anything that could be remotely construed as gloating, like the Mission Accomplished banner, could be turned against him. So you saw a very solemn, sober uh, mood from the president, unlike Bremer, who came out, we got him. President Bush was very solemn, very formal. Well, I think, you know, it's, 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 it's not a time for gloating, as Bill says, but you've got to be excited about this. I mean, literally, the ace of spades in that deck, that famous deck of cards that's been captured. Yeah, I think the ace in the hole. <laughs> ace in the hole now. <laughs> that's exactly right. And there are about 13 left, but nobody of that stature. This is the key in terms of intelligence. I think this is really going to open a door in terms of not only following the dollars, where the dollars are hidden, but also getting information about the cooperation that Iraq was receiving from other countries. Uh, this is really going to be a tremendous bounty for American forces. In terms of the president's speech, he had three key messages. First message clearly is that the justice that Saddam Hussein denied to others is going to be provided by the American forces. What a signal that is to the world that uh, we don't go out and string people up. We don't torture people. You can see that they're offering medical treatment. Uh, you know, uh, they're picking lice out of his head or whatever. They're, they're getting DNA in a, in, a, in a way treating him with some respect. I think it's quite a signal. The second thing is he said to the Iraqi people, you're going to have sovereignty, you're going to have dignity, you're going to have the opportunity for a better life. A strong, positive message for the Iraqi people. And he also thanked the armed forces. And I'm glad he did it because what a performance by our armed forces. Tremendous, tremendous performance under months of pressure. Uh, and finally, he said to the American people that really this is part of the war on terror and made a connection I think others will argue about politically but said this is part of security for the United States and in that sense I think he said you know we have got this job done and we're going to keep up we're going to be resolved. Speaking of the war on terror there had been as you all know some question about whether this would lead to a let, a let up in the, uh, in, the, in the attacks and the resistance and there has just now been uh, explosions heard in Baghdad and we can go now to correspondent David Piper who is there in Baghdad. Uh, what, is the, uh, what is the latest there? Hi, yes, we've, we've just heard a very loud explosion about half, an, half a mile from our outside broadcast site. The picture that you can actually see now in our live position is the flames from the explosion. Basically, the blast happened moments after President Bush finished his speech, and I looked out the window and I could actually see flames and a huge pail of smoke rising. Now, this is downtown Baghdad. We don't know exactly where it is at the moment, but uh, where is the it in timing of this blast does seem a bit ominous. David, is it is it anywhere in relation to the to that so-called green zone, the security perimeter around the presidential uh, palaces that are used by the uh, the uh, coalition provisional authority? No, it doesn't. It doesn't seem to be that that position. That's actually over the other side of the building, um, across the Tigris River. But uh, there are a number of establishments around in the middle of the city. But it's not clear at the moment where exactly that is. But uh, and I suppose um, not clear it what it was very, either. Right? Very large explosion. I suppose it's not clear well, what it was. I actually. Well, it was very much a very, very loud blast because I actually rushed to the window and actually saw the flames shoot up <coughs> in the air as, as, it, as the explosion happened. So we're, we're just trying to find out exactly at the moment what it is. Well, David, thank you very much uh, for keeping us posted on that. Obviously, we're going to be hearing from you uh, often for the rest of the day. Thanks again. And thanks to my colleagues here in the studio and to Jim Angle as well, who I'd like to go back to for just a final thought on this day for this president. Jim? Brett, uh, the one reason those explosions are a perfect example of why the president was so cautious in saying that Saddam's ca capture does not mean the end of violence, but what he did say was that this is a vindication of administration policy. The way he put it was, we have come to this moment through patience and resolve, and that security is assured by perseverance. Uh, it has been a long, tough slog so far in Iraq, very controversial, as you know, both here at home and abroad. The president is saying, you just keep your nose to the grindstone, and these are the kind of results that you eventually get. It is slow, it is tough, but you just have to keep going. Britt. Jim Angle, thank you very much. Thanks again to everybody. This has been a Fox News Alert. I'm Britt Hume in Washington. My colleague Brian Wilson is next with Weekend Live. We leave you now with President Bush again speaking about the capture of Saddam Hussein.